The question of how great leaders are made affects us all, whether you are an investor who is selecting a great management team to invest in, or a business owner who wants to become a more inspiring and motivational leader. We're speaking now with an expert on leadership and management strategy, Carl Moore, professor at McGill University's Deseltel Faculty of Business, who has also taught on executive and MBA programs at Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge, Oxford, and INSEAD. Carl is also the host of the CEO Series, a radio show broadcasted across Canada on the Bell Media Network. Carl was nominated for a Thinker's 50 Distinguished Achievements Award in the leadership category and is the author of several books on management, including his newest title, Generation Y, How Boomers Can Lead and Learn from Millennials and Gen Z. Carl, excited to host you today on the David Lynn Report. Welcome. Um, excited to host you today. I have to admit, I attended McGill I graduated from the Desital faculty, and I never took any of your classes. I'm though. so upset about that, David. But uh, maybe when you do your master's or something. <laughs> one day, one day. But uh, I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to speak to you and, and get a 30-minute education from you today. So welcome to my show. And uh, we're going to be talking about leadership and strategy and your new book, Generation Y, How Boomers Can Learn. Uh, where it can lead and learn from millennials and Gen Z. This is a very interesting topic. We never, we don't typically think of the older generation learning from the younger one, but the book did come out recently. Congratulations on the book launch, and we'll talk about the themes of that book. Uh, Professor Moore, I want to start with this question. You've talked to a lot of leaders on your own radio show. You've talked to a lot of CEOs, industry experts, industry leaders. What do they all have in common? How do they get to the C-suite? Well, there's many paths to the C-suite, but essentially, David, the most important is that you perform, that you deliver the results uh, defined by the board, defined by executive management in a way that's appropriate. So part of what we would add today, maybe we didn't add it, we certainly didn't adequately 10 or 20 years ago, is the way you treat people. Now, at a certain point, if you, you know, had an affair or something, that may well get you kicked out as it should, the executive suite, where today it's beyond something, you know, illegal like that or very immoral to just how you treat people, the language you use is a bit of an issue that we've got to think about. So to this end, uh, about four or five years ago, I started a politically correct council, I called it. Uh, I was calling it woke last year, but I was just down in New York and woke is a very emotive term uh, on both sides of the house in the US. So I'm calling it a empathy council. So I have six undergrads and a senior executive who advised me on how to be up to date in terms of my language. So th there's an element of delivering results, but in a way today which is appropriate and respectful of the diversity we have in our workforce. And you gotta think about the environment. So those are some of the issues that are becoming very important to senior executives. But the, the, the starting point is that you perform and deliver the results that are required by the organization and the particular role you have at the time. That's the central starting point is doing it right but not at the expense of of mistreating your colleagues or the people or you know using language that upsets people is what you're saying well you know 15 20 years ago uh, in business people might swear a lot they may treat women badly and do things like that in a certain degree most sins were forgiven if you made the results where today it's got to be results, but in a way that treats women and minorities respectfully, that shows that you understand that environment's a big deal, that EDI is a big deal. So there's an element there of shifting to adding some elements of you got to be within more narrow band, bands. Now, in the past, those were pretty wide out, like you know, something you just couldn't do because you'd get to jail for it. But short of that, today we're looking at a more narrow set of requirements, though I don't think they're narrow in the in the best sense of the word, that they are things that we should all be thinking about that we did not think about adequately in the past. So can you give us one or two examples? You don't have to give specific names, but a few examples that you've studied where the CEO has not delivered shareholder value and why he's failed in doing so, he or she. Well, it's, it's partly is that... Um, one of the problems is that older people who had great track records can dwell in the past too much. So this is one of the problems. I remember I interviewed a guy named General Martin Dempsey. He, I taught with him at Duke. He was a four-star general, became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Obama. So he was the most senior general in the U.S. One of the things he said when I interviewed him in his office in the Pentagon that was uh, quite a memorable interview, as you might imagine, was that generals fight the battles of their youth. Is a famous saying. 
And it's a danger as you get older, you've got success, you've got experience, but you're dealing with the world today in a way that made sense five or 10 or 20 years ago. So one of the challenges for a successful leader is to go, the world's changed. I've got to change how we do business in order to remain successful. And we've also broadened what the word success means, that it's financial performance, no question about it. But it's also, are you concerned about the environment appropriately? Are you concerned about minorities? Are you concerned about women? Are you concerned about those EDI issues? Are you concerned about purpose is a third thing I would add these days, that our organization is merely not about spewing cash out, but in bringing, bringing purpose and meaning to the lives of our employees and other stakeholders. So the game has shifted a bit, but part of it is even just getting good old results, David, what you have to do is realize the game's changing, and I've got to change more rapidly to that. So in a turbulent environment, you have the uh, organization, a pyramid, if you would, that if the world outside is not changing much, leave the old way of doing things. But if you live in a turbulent environment, what you must do is change inside how we do things, how we're organized, who reports to, stuff like that. We need to change that more rapidly to align with that turbulent environment. So that's something where successful people can fall in the trap of the old ways are still adequate when they're not. And that can lead to a lack of performance. Carl, before we talk about your work on introverts versus extroverts, I want to ask you this. What is the difference between a leader and a manager? Would you make that distinction? I think so. A manager should also be a bit of a leader, but leadership is about going and taking us in the right direction, often a new direction. So it's about where we're going. It's about strategy is how we're going to get there and inspiring people and encouraging them and working with them so that they're willing to take on the risk of change and the risk of going in a different direction. So in my mind, that's about leadership. Management is saying, we're doing this, we're going to do it more effectively and more efficiently, but we're going to do the same things. So leadership, to my mind, is at least some degree is about changing and going off in directions that are appropriate for today's world. Uh, I'm going to bring up a statistic for you, uh, Carl. The uh, the total non-farm quit rate as published by the St. Louis Fed in the U.S. in 2020, in April, it was at 1.5 percent. At the peak in 2022, it was at 2.9 percent, 3 percent, almost yeah, exactly doubled. It's been trending down since its peak, but it's still higher than pre-pandemic highs. Why have people been quitting their jobs? Generally speaking. You know, why do you, especially the younger generation, why, why do they quit at a higher rate than the previous generation? And the second part of the question is, what can leadership do to prevent a high turnover rate at whatever organization they're leading? Well, part of it is there's more opportunities. There's a war for talent out there. And we see evidence that when I talk to my undergraduates, MBAs, about the job opportunities they have, had lunch with a, a graduate from about seven years ago today, works for a bank here in Montreal. And partly there's other opportunities, other organizations are for looking for talented people. So they'll want to get you away from your and give you opportunities. So there is that temptation of a war for talent. There's more opportunities out there. For, so I'm more apt to lead, leave rather because I can get something better. So that's one side of it. The flip side is I'm willing to stay where I am, maybe for a little bit less money, if I feel that I'm doing something which has purpose, I feel recognized, I feel inspired, and I've got some great leaders, you can keep people. And I think a second thing is, some, is that we're talking a lot more about mental health than we did a few years ago, David. And even my undergrads are talking about mental health in a way they did three or four years ago. So post-pandemic, we're much more aware of mental health as a world, and we're aware that it was tough to work from home. And society, through conversations, decided that we could talk about mental health, and there's a lot more discussion of that going on. So part of why some people are leaving is because mental health reasons, they need a break, uh, they recognize that they can get a job fairly easily out there, so you take some time off to help recover and get over some of the things they're dealing with, which is has always been true, but I think it's more of a, something we're aware of and giving ourselves permission and room to do. So a couple of reasons that are in there, why we see those rates going up. 
Okay. Uh, well, one thing you have looked a lot into is the uh, the current generation and how I guess their attitudes or uh, or, or uh, style of work differs from their previous generation. We typically don't think about learning from the younger generation. It's usually the other way around. We learn from you know people like you, Carl, with more wisdom and knowledge and experience. But your book uh, suggests that we can't. So, what have you learned from? talking to students and younger people and the millennials and Gen Zs that perhaps you haven't learned before in your own research? Well, part of it is what I call reverse mentoring. So 30% of the time undergraduates, MBAs are reverse mentoring me. They're teaching me. Now, I do remind them at 70% of the time I'm still mentoring you. So we're not throwing you know the older people off the side of the boat by any means at all. But the idea, like I have a couple of older mentors uh, at my age, they're in their 80s now, it would not occur to them to ask my advice, by and large, where mentoring is one way, the older to the younger, where what I'm saying in a turbulent world of technological change, of uh, innovative disruption coming along, that I need to have frontline troops, that is younger people who are closer to the real world, that turbulent environment, and are in it. One of the teams we have for them are boundary spanners. They have one foot in the turbulent environment, one foot in the organization. They get more data about what's going on, and they don't have the outdated views of the past that I might have at times. So they have fresher views. So I want them to teach me and help me develop strategy. Now, the senior people still are responsible for strategy, but the job of senior management is not to have the strategic idea so much as to spot good ones as they arise within an empowered workforce that is everybody's encouraged to be a strategist to some degree. So I want to tap into those people that they can teach me about what's going on in today's world and suggest ways that we can do a better job with our customers, with our suppliers, with our other uh, stakeholders. So it's that learning from younger people is a newish thought that I think we need to take on board these days without any question. What are younger people looking for when they're entering the workplace that perhaps was different than the previous generation? I mean, money and salary aside, we're all looking for a way to make a living. But besides that, is there anything else that the younger generation want in their workplace satisfaction that perhaps wasn't there 40 years ago? Oh, for sure. I mean, things like EDI, uh, they can get wound up a little bit, but I think it's by and large a good thing. They're saying, how are you treating minorities? How are you treating women? How are you treating people that are not the average? And, and showing them respect and making room for them is a central thing that we wind them up at McGill and other schools. That's what they're thinking about. Another one is the environment. What are you doing for the environment? And I was out interviewing the CEO of Bombardier. He talked quite a bit about their business jets and how they're environmentally better. Interviewed the uh, CEO of Airbus Canada about what used to be called the C-Series Bombardier and now the A220. A big thing is that it's environmentally better than other planes. When you talk to the uh, F1, we have an F1 event at McGill coming up in June. Uh, a big issue of the teams like Aston Martin is the environmental impact of not only the cars, but getting all their staff. Instead of sending them around the world, what they're doing is keeping them in England, for example, and having them joined by technology to reduce their environmental footprint. And, and the third thing would be purpose. The sense that our organization is doing something noble in the world, it's not just about getting the chair a second Rolls Royce. You know, I'm not sure why the chair needed a second Rolls Royce anyway, but I, I remember there's a famous bumpy, bumper sticker when I was uh, a little bit older than you that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. And when I mentioned that, undergraduates are horrified by the boomers and they're focused on things like, you know, what kind of car you drove, how nice were your house, what kind of suit you had, stuff that we somewhat, I'm embarrassed to admit, that we boomers somewhat measured ourselves on. So it's getting away from that kind of selfish view of the world to more of a sense of we're doing something noble and useful here at our organization. So those are some of the newer elements that you got to keep in mind when you're trying to appeal to Z's. And I think the final one is... Uh, it's the name of my book, Generation Y. They like to ask why a lot and understand what's going on. Now, I wrote an article for the Globe a couple years ago, Never Apologize, Never Explain, Bad Ideas with Millennials. That was the second most read article in the business section of that year. It really resonated with people. So a famous saying was, never apologize, never explain. I apologize easily and explain everything. 
you know, there might be why we we fired someone. We wouldn't. But 99 percent of decisions we explain because I'd like young people to say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not sure that's true. Wait a minute. When you explain why, they can explain why the thinking may not be 100 percent. And if they improve my thinking, hence my strategy, it's a great thing for us. And so that idea of explaining a lot and having lots of conversations and bringing them into the strategic thinking is something which is a real value in terms of how strategy is often done, not always, but often done today. The, the uh, priorities of, uh, of social issues that have creeped into the younger generation, is that a generational shift or is that just because they're younger? And, and in fact, we observe this, pri- this level of priority, these, these sets of priorities in every generation with the younger people. There's some truth to that. Um, you know, Churchill, who died a long time ago, said, if you're not a liberal and you're young, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative and you're old, you have no head. So when you get invested, you go, um, wait a minute, they're burning down my BMW. It's different than let's go, you know, burn down a car and, and protest to the authorities. So the, the baby boomers were the hippies to some degree of the 60s and 70s. So there is somewhat just being young. But I'm arguing that these changes are going to be climate change is like a something we're going to have to fight for your whole life, David. You're going to have to deal with your generation. So it's a, a fundamental change that we're going to have to take on board. So I think the social issues are ones that are somewhat of today, but are ones that are going to be long lasting throughout, as far as we can see, your whole life. Forbes publishes their annual uh, best companies to work for world's best employers list every year. Um, you know, you can debate this list, but uh, I'm just going to quote some of these companies here. So as of 2022, the top five names, Samsung, Microsoft, IBM, Alphabet, Apple. Do these big names share anything in common that would make them good employers in places you would want to work for? Well, it strikes me they're all high tech. And I think part of high tech now, high tech in the last few months, David, you know, they've been laying off people and it's a strange world for high tech where I, I was with IBM 30 years ago and then Hitachi and used to go to the Silicon Valley every month. Um, wish I'd bought some apartment buildings. But again, that's another story down there. But it's something where they've always had to pay well to get top talent and to keep them. So the Valley... I, I go to the Valley every year, if not once or twice a year, but somewhat it's the future of the economy and leadership. What they're doing down there will end up doing five years later in Toronto, Montreal. Now, some of the ideas are dumb, will burn off, but by and large, what they do in the Valley and they do in high tech companies are things which are early indicators that the rest of us have got to do it. So you keep your eye on that. It's the nature of the industry. They're on the edge. And they have to be to a certain degree to attract people as they do to get some of the brightest and the best. So I, I think that's one commonality that holds them together. They're the industry and, and the demands of the high-tech industry and of the Silicon Valley in New York and the places where those firms tend to be located in big numbers. It's interesting how these companies, like you mentioned, are in, are in tech. But uh, when it comes down to an economic downturn, tech stocks tend to perform or underperform the broad index because of the higher beta, which leads to my next question. What types of companies are likely to survive a recession? And I don't mean just sectors. I mean companies that have prepared for recessions. What have they done differently that sets them apart from the competitors during an economic downturn? Some of this may be, you know, good planning, good strategy. Some may be just dumb luck that you happen to have lots of cash on hand. Now, whether you did that deliberately, I mean, Bombardier has been very actively paying down their huge debt. I mean, billions of dollars. And I get uh, announcements every quarter about how they're making good progress, how they're using their cash flow to pay down debt. But they had huge debt to deal with. So I think if you happen to have cash from the bank, that's very helpful. Sometimes that's just pure luck. But to be in something where you can raise your prices and the market's going to respond to it reasonably positively is a very helpful place to be. But again, that just depends on the market you're in and the dynamics of it. Um, I think people who saw it coming or reacted quickly to conserve their cash, to be ready for the opportunities because during a, during a recession, you might be able to do some interesting M and A, but you're going to get companies for much lower. You have to have the cash, but you also have a certain amount of chutzpah that I have the courage to buy something in spite of the fact we may not be at the lowest point. 
but I think that's something where there's some neat opportunities for M and A out there uh, if you have the courage to do it and uh, the cash to do it. Uh, just on that note, the CEOs that you've spoken to, what is their general sentiment on the economy right now? Oh, it's mixed for sure. I mean, many of them see a recession coming. Uh, I mean, a, a recession is there's a technical term for it, like it's two uh, quarters of negative growth. So there's either we are or aren't. I mean, that's black and white. But certainly, lower growth is something that is on the mind of virtually all these CEOs, and they think about what they can do to get the growth back. I mean, I, I interviewed the CEO of the Blue Jays yesterday, uh, Mark Shapiro. Um, I've been this is my third interview I've done over the years with Mark, and he's part of a committee at the uh, baseball that is change the rules a bit. So we went to the Yankees Blue Jays game uh, yesterday in Toronto and they have a 20 second clock for the pitcher. And what it does is speed up the game. So part of it is that baseball was kind of losing a bit of the appeal because it was slow moving, which maybe older people appreciate, but the younger generation were not buying into it, David. And so by changing that key rule, it sped up the game and it more apt appeal to younger people. And a lot of Americans didn't grow up in America. They're immigrants. Is same in Canada. So they've got to be won over by baseball. I think that was a great strategic move to win over younger people. So you got to do some interesting changes in times like this. But for the brave, hopefully not foolish as well, there are some neat opportunities out there for sure. Certainly layoffs are one reaction to an economic downturn. But generally speaking, uh, Carl, if you were to advise a CEO on how to survive a recession, uh, besides cost cutting, what are some of the other measures that a CEO should take to reignite the growth and prepare for an economic boom like you just talked about? Well, sometimes where where's your revenue coming from? How can I grow the revenue, get a bigger share from the customers, take some away from my competitors who might be focused on other things? And it's also, what are the next exciting products in my industry that I can bring maybe sooner to market and get that excitement going out there? What are the channels of distribution? Uh, lots of times you're rethinking very basic things about your business model. And there's competitors who are coming along saying, uh, we're just going to change how you do business. So one of my students is doing a law tech uh, startup where... What you do is uh, you store a lot of information online and it's helping you that it, in the terrible chance that something happened to you, um, your family would have all that information available and it would have been set so they can go to the court and get approval uh, that it would go to where you want it to go. So there's some neat things coming along where I think you can um, do better if you really getting ready for the next generation of things. Have your students' interest in the careers pointed to perhaps the next fastest growing segment? Well, 10 years ago, they were really focused. Uh, iBanking and McKinsey, uh, BCG and Bain were kind of the high prestige things to get into. And they still are. I had lunch with one of my former students at McKinsey in Toronto yesterday. Been there about nine months. So that's still very cool. But there's more of a range of startups is one of the things that I've seen a real change in the last 10 years, David, that startups are much more of interest to young people. Now, it might be they're going to go work in the corporate world for a couple of years and then do a startup, but more and more they're doing startups while they're in university and they get out there and they might work in someone else's startup, but the view is they want to do their own. That is something they did not do anywhere near as much 10 years ago, for sure. Uh, final question, and uh, I'll let you go, Carl. This has been a very lightning talk. Thank you for being here. I remember when I was in school at McGill at the Desiltel faculty, uh, I can't remember which professor asked us this, but it was like it was, a, it was an orientation event, I think. And they asked us, raise your hand if you all want to be a CEO at one point in your life. And I think the majority of the class raised their hands. Now, obviously, nobody is, not everybody is now a CEO. You, you can't all be leaders, but I think that was the aspiration. And so for the people raising their hands today, for the people in their first year, who want to be someday in the C-suite, what is your best piece of advice to get there? Get some leadership experience probably at, at college itself. So you learn how to do it at a younger age with you know other people your own age. So do volunteer stuff, get into leadership positions, learn how to lead by actually leading would be, I think, very helpful. Then in your 20s, what you want to do is probably get your master's out of the way and start getting some foundational experience, learning from great people and great organizations then it's probably later on the 30s and 40s that you might transfer somewhere else and really take advantage of that base you built in your 20s, including at college when you were a leader as well. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, Carl. Thank you for being here.